So first I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to present my work here today. So this was work that I started um, as a postdoc at NC State under Jim Holland, and it's part of the Atlas project, um, who Randy Weiser is the PI for, who's at the University of Delaware, and I'm continuing this work at the University of Illinois, where I recently started as an assistant professor. Um, so today I'll be talking about some resequencing work that I've been doing in maize, specifically focusing on land races in maize. So um, again, I'll start a little bit with the project background today, um, why we're trying to resequence the land races, uh, why we chose AmpliSeq to do that, um, more about the regions that we selected, and then some of our preliminary results from the pilot study that we have um, completed. So here in this graph, I'm showing you where maize is grown today. So all of those green regions are um, areas of maize production in the world. So maize was originally domesticated in Mexico, and you can see that it has spread throughout the world in this um, graphic. So the um, wild ancestor of maize is photoperiod sensitive. So in order to spread and adapt to other environments, um, photoperiod sensitivity was really important. Uh, so what is photoperiodism? Um, it's the response of plants to relative lengths of light and dark, so basically um, whether a plant will flower, when it will flower. Um, so here in this picture, um, which was taken in North Carolina, so a more northern latitude, um, we can see on the left B73, which is the sequenced reference line for maize. Um, it's temperate and it's relatively photoperiod insensitive. Um, on the right, we can see teosinte, which is the, it's not flowering. Um, there's no, so on the B73, you can see the tassels are out, the male flowers. You can also see ears um, versus teosinte, which is not flowering here. Um, and if you were to observe these two different genotypes in, say, Mexico, they would be flowering at about the same time. So this is the phenomenon that we're looking at. Um, in this picture, I'm showing teosinte versus a temperate maize line, but also a lot of tropical lines that are grown and um, closer to the equator also experience photoperiod sensitivity, so they're difficult to move that germplasm out of, um, out of the tropical environments, and it affects other um, parts of the plant architecture as well, not just uh, flowering time. So what we're really interested in is adaptation to different environments, to different geographies, um, to different latitudes. So what are the genes that are involved in flowering time in maize? Um, there are a number of different pathways that have been elucidated to be involved in flowering time and photosensitivity. So you can see some of those there that you would expect, like the circadian clock, genes involved in the circadian clock. Um, you can see some genes there for photoperiod in the photoperiod pathway. So there are um, some genes that have been shown to be involved in specifically the photoperiod pathway. Um, but there's a lot of different things coming together here. So we have a picture in this of what the pathways are. Um, but we wanted to ask which alleles um, underlie adaptation over wide geographies. So from that, um, there we. Natural, so using a multi-parent population in maize, the nested association mapping population, uh, Jim Holland and John Dobley and others have looked at um, different regions of the maize genome that are associated with flowering time and with photoperiod sensitivity. Um, so you can see on chromosome 10, which is at the bottom, uh, the CCT gene, which has been cloned to underlie photoperiod sensitivity in maize. Um, it's known that there's a cacta inser transposon insertion um, in the promoter of the gene, so it affects the um, gene expression. Um, and that arose after domestication. And you can see there's other genes. Some of the genes that are known to be in the pathways co-localize with some of the regions that have been mapped. Um, there's other regions where there, we're not, we don't know what the genes are that are underlying those QTL and the pathways aren't overlapping there. So, but we basically, we have a good idea of genes that are underlying photoperiod sensitivity. Um, so in order to ask this question about which alleles are important for adaptation, um, we curated 
a panel of diverse land race materials, um, which you can see in the picture here. So all of those red dots are where the land races were collected. Um, this germplasm was curated by Major Goodman at NC State, um, and Shilpa Suit worked on um, collecting the DNA co and growing the plants out. Um, so the northernmost accession was collected at 52 North in Canada. The southernmost accession was uh, collected at about 40 South in Chile. So we have a really good span of latitudes in this germplasm. Um, we also have a, a lot of phenotypic and geographic diversity. So we have, for example, in terms of altitude, the highest collection um, site was at 3,900 meters, and it goes all the way down to six meters. So um, we also have a large uh, sampling of altitudes. So in total, there's 372 accessions, which represent 307 land races. So that's a really good sample of land race diversity. In addition to the land races, um, there's also 12 uh, accession wild ac relatives of maize that were included, um, which you can see the species listed there. One of the other questions that we were interested in answering was how much diversity is within an accession compared to between accessions. Um, and so we, s in order to answer that question, we sampled five plants per accession. So that brought our sample number to about 2,000. So it, it's a lot of C DNA samples that we were interested in. So then we started thinking about how can we genotype for the, our regions of interest. Um, we all know the story about the decrease in cost of sequencing. This um, was graphic was from 2014. And you can see that the price has decreased significantly, although it's still expensive um, if you want to do is resequence a lot of samples. So here it's around $5,000 for a human genome, which the maize genome is about the same size um, as the human genome. So we thought about different ways of doing this. Um, one method we thought about was there's already some a lot of diversity in the HapMap data set that has been captured. So there's 916 resequenced maize lines. But we felt that there would be more diversity in this land race sample than was in the HapMap data set. Um, we thought about doing some sequencing in some of the land races and then doing genotyping. So it was about this time we started exploring AmpliSeq um, in order to do just a one-step process where we could identify novel variants and do the genotyping all in one step, and we didn't have to do um, a discovery phase before that. So I think the last presentation we heard a really nice outline of how this process works, so I won't go into too much detail here. Other than we had candidate regions, we were shooting for about 20 candidate genes in this study, and again, um, we could look at a larger number of candidate genes through AmpliSeq than we could have through other methods. Um, so we put those target regions into the designer. So we designed our primer pool around the time that the maize genome just came online for AmpliSeq. So we did it through their website. It's a bit of a black box. Um, we tile the, so basically the amplicons are tiled across the target region. Uh, we did the half reactions that we heard about in the last presentation. So we did one pool. Um, of 159 amplicons, the other pool had 160, and then uh, we pulled those back together after the initial amplification phase. Um, so after you amplify the targets, uh, you partially digest it, ligate the adapters and the barcodes. Or initially, we wanted to uh, barcode uh, 384 samples together, although as we started getting some preliminary results back, we decided to, to kind of bring that back and just do 192. We then equalized, pooled, and we sequenced with the ion torrent PGM. We used a 318 chip. So what were the genes that we were targeting? So you can see here in this table um, the candidate genes that we were targeting. Um, I believe it's seven chromosomes we were looking at here. The total space that we were interested in was about 86 kb. Um, the design, I think, is 72 kb, so we covered a pretty good fraction of that. Um, you can see that uh, for different genes, we have better coverage or worse coverage. Um, some of that seemed to be, if it was GC-rich, um, it just we couldn't design primers across that, right? 
Um, and also we cover 2KB upstream and downstream of the genes as well because we wanted to capture the variation in those regions. Um, and then uh, point your attention to ZMCCT, which is at the bottom, the last gene on chromosome 10 there. Um, and our total size for that gene was a lot larger because there is the transposon insertion upstream of the gene that we were interested in capturing the variation around there. Um, however, that has challenges because as you start to get out of the gene, you start to run into repetitive DNA um, that's in maize. So we think this is actually really good in terms of how much we were able to cover because of the repetitive nature of the maize genome and also um, how much variation there is in the maize genome. Uh, but I will have to say that we did relax our design parameters a little bit when we chose our design. So the initial designs that had were classified as having high specificity were covering maybe 50% of our, our regions. So we relaxed that a little bit and chose a less specific design in order to try to capture more of the regions. So then we got the, so we did a validation set, which was a plate of 95 samples. It included 19 land races. Most of those were from Bolivia um, and with one accession from Argentina. We also included um, B73, which is the sequenced reference line, um, Mo17, which is an inbred line, uh, CML322, which is a tropical inbred line, um, and then the hybrids of those to try to assay for heterozygosity and see how well we could do in calling heterozygosity. So the first step we did was we wanted to compare different alignment algorithms and see what was better going forward. So in order to do that, we simulated data. So we took the B73 reference genome, um, pulled out our target regions, and then fed it into um, a program that would generate reads that were about the same size in, in terms of number. Um, and then use those simulated reads, um, align them with Bowtie 2 and BWA MEM to see which one was doing a better job. Uh, and I want to point your attention to the percentage of reads that are off target. So 4% uh, of the reads are off target for Bowtie 2 compared to zero for BWA MEM. Um, and our mean amplicon coverage that we were expecting based on the simulated data was about 147x. Um, you can see how that breaks down of, in terms of coverage at different, at 2x, 10x, 20x, and 30x um, in this table. We were shooting for 12x in order to cover, accurately call heterozygotes. So then um, this is comparing this to the actual data now, which was done, uh, used a BWA MEM um, alignment. And you can see that a lot higher, you were observing a lot higher percentage of off-target reads, and we think that's probably because we used a less specific design. Um, so we were seeing about 20% of our reads being off-target, um, and you can see how that breaks down again at different uh, coverage rates. So one of the questions we had was, what's the relationship between the amplicon length um, and the number of reads? We were concerned that maybe there was some um, favoring of smaller amplicons, uh, and we had done a few tweaks to try to increase the specificity and also get rid of um, anything that was too short. Uh, so you can see here that there is a relationship that as the amplicons get longer, we see fewer reads, although our largest amplicons are still covered. There's still coverage on them. Um, so we think it's doing a pretty good job across the amplicons. And we expect probably some presence absence variation just based on the nature of the maize genome. We also tried comparing different um, variant callers. I think we heard about this from the last presentation about variant calling as well. So we compared GATK to SAM tools, um, and then we we're comparing all of this to the HapMap v3 data set. So again, the HapMap v3 data set is 916 diverse maze lines. Um, so these are known, we'll call this our known variant set. So we had 868 variants that were in common between all three data sets, between GATK, SAM tools, and HapMap. Um, so we also, are identifying novel variations. So we had 410 variants that were unique to both SAM tools and GATK. So both algorithms were calling these SNPs. And we have 
we've done our filtering with a minor allele frequency of 2%. So we think that these are real novel variants that we're calling. Um, and the other thing I just want to say about this is that we are only looking at the SNPs here um, because the HapMap data set had more SNPs than it did indels. We just filtered the indels out of all three data sets and we're just looking at the SNPs here. One of the other data checks we wanted to do was to compare um, the di distribution of where the variants were in the genome. So the pink bars are where the design are, so the percentage of the bases that are covered, how do they fall um, downstream, upstream, exons, uh, UTRs, et cetera, and then compared that to the variants that are called with GATK and SAM tools. And this is kind of what we would expect to see in this situation where we're seeing more variants in the downstream and the upstream regions and um, we're seeing fewer variants in the exons, which again, this is kind of what you would expect, where you would expect to see variation. Uh, so as a, uh, we wanted to look at the, um, some other parameters as well. So about how well these different algorithms were working. One of the questions we were asking um, was how frequently does the reference sample have the alternate allele? So B73 is the sequenced reference line. We wanted to see how many alternate alleles we had. Um, and it did vary between methods. So the um, GATK was the best in terms. We only saw um, one variant different from the that was an alternate allele. Um, and I would just want to say that this could be technical error, this could be sequencing error, but it could also be biological. We weren't using the exact same uh, DNA sample of B73 as what was sequenced. So it, this is technical error, but it could also be biological. Uh, we also wanted to assess our, the proportion of heterozygotes that we were able to call as heterozygotes. Um, and it, you can see the two hybrids we have here of B73 uh, by CML322 or B73 and MO17 hybrids. Um, so it does a really good job of calling heterozygotes. Um, GATK does a little bit better. So with that, I'd like to move on to the conclusion. So we were happy with the sequencing coverage. Um, we got over 100x coverage, which was more than what we really needed. Um, it's highly multiplexed, so I presented the validation set today, um, which was 96, 95 samples. Um, but we, for the moving on past the validation set, we've been multiplexing 192 together and have been satisfied with the results. Uh, we were also able to identify novel variation that was not in the present present HapMap data set. So we're looking at um, more diverse materials and we're calling novel variants, which is what we were expecting. Um, we're also able to successfully call heterozygotes, which was one of our main goals. Um, so we're at the point now where we can start to ask the biological questions, where we can start to look at the population genetics um, and really answer some of the questions that we set out to answer in the beginning. I feel we have the technology down now. Um, so just tips if you're designing AmpliSeq or doing an AmpliSeq project. Um, I think that initial primer pool design is really important in the beginning um, and consider really carefully that trade-off between specificity um, and the percentage of the region that's covered. Um, again, multiplexing, so we have our average coverage, but then you have to look at the distribution of what percentage of the reads are being covered at the coverage that you needed to be covered. Um, and we did do some small tweaks um, in the library prep, which uh, we worked with someone from Thermo Fisher for that, and it was really helpful. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge Jim Holland. Um, Shilpa Sood had worked on curating the germplasm. Also, Randy Weiser, who's at the University of Delaware. Uh, Major Goodman, who had uh, curated this germplasm. Uh, Corbin Jones, so we did the sequencing at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, and also the people at Thermo Fisher that really made this project possible. So with that, I'll take any questions.
They do. So it's part of the Torrance Wheat software um, is that there you can get BAM files back with your data and also variants. But this was diverse germplasm, and we wanted to to see kind of dig in more into the alignments and the variant calling software. And we were really concerned about the heterozygotes as well. So we decided to look at different ways of implementing the bioinformatics. Yeah. 